Can you imagine anything more embarrassing than being the weakest hunter in a world of super powerful hunters and mages? Well, that's exactly the situation our MC finds himself in. Not only is he the lowest of the low as an F-rank hunter, but he's also the butt of everyone's jokes. After being constantly disappointed by others, his heart is now filled with anger and envy. And it's this envy that leads him to gain a unique skill that not only boosts his strength, but also comes with a strange catch. Curious to find out how our poor hunter becomes a triple S rank suicide hunter? Then buckle up and get ready for a wild ride as we uncover this mystery. Manga begins with the latest update coming from the 40th floor of the towering structure known as Babylon. The Black Dragon Guild has opted to launch an assault on that specific floor, showing confidence as they vow to demonstrate the prowess of a top-tier guild. However, their return is once again marked by disappointment and emptiness. The reason behind the failure of the Black Dragon Guild lies with none other than the esteemed number one hunter, renowned as the Flame Emperor. With unparalleled skill and determination, he orchestrates a one-man massacre, vanquishing the formidable boss on the 40th floor without assistance. The press erupts in applause for the Flame Emperor, lauding him for achieving yet another milestone. Since the tower's emergence, he stands as the sole individual capable of single-handedly defeating the boss, solidifying his legendary status. The reporter inquires if he has anything to say. However, he appears irritated and swiftly seizes the microphone from the reporter's grasp. He conveys his disappointment and questions why his title hasn't been changed first. He queries why they continue to use the title Flame Emperor instead of his actual name, which he considers to be a distasteful nickname. He expresses his displeasure and asserts that it would be preferable to be called Plague rather than be associated with this name. He declares his intention to locate those responsible for creating the nickname and subject them to torture. Our MC observes the interview on his laptop and admires the Flame Emperor's ability to freely express himself. The reporter extends a sincere apology to the Flame Emperor for the use of the undesired name. Meanwhile, our envious lad shifts his attention to the HunterNet app on his cell phone, where discussions regarding the Flame Emperor are ablaze, despite the worldwide attention drawn to his recent display of disrespect. Amidst the divided opinions, some adamantly defend his character and use his legendary status as justification. Conversely, one individual reproaches a fellow fan for defending the Flame Emperor's behavior, asserting that despite their admiration, they must acknowledge the truth of the Flame Emperor's actions. Undeterred, the defender maintains that they are merely stating facts. In their opinion, his true nature is widely recognized by everyone, even the organizations. During the interview, some fans are talking about rumors of the Flame Emperor's affair with one of the saints. Fans are still debating whether he is really dating the saint. However, one of the friends of the saint rejects this rumor. Meanwhile, our boy keeps writing the same sentences several times in dreams of becoming like the Flame Emperor. Soon, people notice that he is repeating himself and begin to guess who he is. But he continues to write the same sentences and feels envious of the rumors that the Flame Emperor is well-liked by everyone and has great wealth. He thinks enviously that if this world were a novel, a man like the Flame Emperor would definitely be the main character, and he would only be a supporting character. It is then that his attention is caught by a reporter who addresses the Flame Emperor. By his name, Yun Soha, he praises the accomplishments of the Flame Emperor, highlighting the fact that there are numerous aspiring hunters who consider him as their role model. It is worth mentioning that he was awakened shortly after entering the tower in his early 20s. Astonishingly, he managed to defeat a black dragon monster boss within a month, a feat that the guild had failed to achieve in the past 10 years. Undoubtedly, he is a legendary hunter who is creating his own tales. Curious about his secret to success, a reporter approached him, well aware of the admiration that aspiring hunters have for the Flame Emperor. The Flame Emperor sighs irritably and reluctantly replies that he will say a few words for them to figure it out. Our boy carefully searches for the key to success. In the end, the Fire Emperor emphasizes that those who are destined to succeed will eventually succeed. However, this is followed by a solemn warning that any attempt to stop him in his tracks will result in death. He then turns and begins to leave, ignoring the journalist's attempts to question him about his previous statement. The journalists are clearly confused and irritated, but they refuse to provide any answers and abruptly end the broadcast. Our protagonist, overcome with emotion, shuts his laptop with tears streaming down his face. He is filled with intense anger and resentment, questioning whether it is acceptable for someone as powerful as the Flame Emperor to disregard others after achieving such greatness. 
Despite the Flame Emperor's disrespectful behavior towards the reporter, he can't help but feel as if the insult was directed at him personally. He wishes that he had a decent skill like the Flame Emperor. He believes that possessing such skills would save him from the monotonous life of living in a workshop, where he is regarded as an F-class hunter with no abilities. Anger fills him as he clenches his fists, yearning to become like the Flame Emperor. He is consumed by jealousy and longs to surpass him in skill. He daydreams about the immense greatness he would achieve if he could master the Flame Emperor's abilities. Suddenly, a brilliant golden light floods his room, capturing his attention instantly. He gazes up in complete surprise, his eyes filled up with tears as he recognizes this extraordinary phenomenon from the countless videos he has watched on the web. His mind races with excitement as he contemplates the possibility that it could be a skill card, a highly coveted item that grants valuable abilities. Just as this thought crosses his mind, a message materializes right in front of him, displaying an envy unlike anything ever witnessed in history. Overwhelmed by his desire, the game panel bestows upon him a brand new skill, leaving him utterly shocked and amazed. He stands there in shock as the unexpected events unfold before him, bringing to mind the stories of people who have received messages of support and rewards from the tower. It appears that this tower is swayed by one's determination, rewarding genuine efforts, and applauding achievements. His eyes widen as he looks at the card, wondering why this message seems a bit different from what he had watched in videos. He questions why he should be concerned about its tone when he has just obtained a skill card. At that very moment, a new notification pops up, announcing that the tower is rejoicing over the accomplishment. Ignoring the message, his attention is fixated on the realization that this is the exact moment he has eagerly anticipated ever since his arrival. And to top it all off, it's a magnificent gold card. With teary eyes, he gazes up at the card and tightly grasps it in his hands. The card emits a dazzling golden hue, representing the prestigious S rank of a skill. A fresh notification pops up on his screen, catching his attention. Without a second's delay, a skill card materializes right before his eyes. His eyes widen as he eagerly scans the description. It's the coveted skill, I want to be like you, rank S+. Plus. This incredible ability automatically triggers upon death, granting him the power to mimic and possess the skills of his fallen foes. However, there's a catch. He can't copy the skills of enemies who have already killed him. And the skill being copied is selected at random. It is also mentioned that utilizing this skill leads to one's demise. Tears well up in his eyes as he ponders over this peculiar technique. How is it possible to acquire the abilities of someone who kills you, only to meet your own demise in the end? Frustration fills his voice as he screams, questioning the nature of such a skill. The tower arrived in this world unexpectedly. Its imposing figure loomed on the world, visible from every corner of the globe. The brave souls with nothing to lose were the initial ones to venture inside, delving into the mysterious depths. Each level of the tower teems with unearthly creatures, presenting a formidable challenge. A select few were chosen by the tower, bestowed with extraordinary powers. As news of these events spread, an increasing number of individuals were drawn to the tower, eager to test their courage against the monsters and potentially gain new abilities. The tower is filled with numerous monsters of different races. During an interview, a man shares that he has recently witnessed the Flame Emperor in a battle. He expresses his admiration for him, describing how he is wielding a flaming spear. The man compares this powerful move to the graceful dance of the Hindu god of destruction, Shiva. Natraja, the depiction of Shiva as the divine dancer, is a symbol of power and destruction. We see that our MC turns to the boss and expresses his desire to watch something else. The shopkeeper mentions that the interview is going smoothly and inquires if he wasn't impressed by the Flame Emperor. Our depressed lad replies softly, stating that despite his accomplishments, the Flame Emperor's attitude remained unchanged and it makes him different from other hunters. The shopkeeper refutes his observation, asserting that he is the type of hero that humanity currently requires. He explains that his lack of enthusiasm has nothing to do with the Flame Emperor. He laments the contrast between those who live extraordinary lives like the Flame Emperor and those who are constantly suffering from bad luck like himself. The shopkeeper sighs as he realizes that the MC is also one of those who feel that way. Tiredy placing his face on the counter, our lad reveals that he acquired the incredible skill just yesterday. However, he chose not to inform the Hunter's Association about it as utilizing this skill would have led to his demise. Overwhelmed with frustration, he bursts into tears and expresses his concerns about taking credit for this technique. 
Looking at his nauseated face, the salesman suggests that he should step outside and release his emotions by vomiting. Upon hearing this, he heads outside. He feels uneasy as he watches the uncertain ranking of the current hunters. The Fire Emperor holds the top spot, followed by the Black Dragon in second place, and the Viper in third. Discomfort builds in his throbbing head, causing him to shudder. Suddenly, a distant scream pierces through the hangover, grabbing his attention. Intrigued, he shifts his gaze to the narrow alley. In this alley, his misty eyes catch the Flame Emperor and the Saint is locked in a tense confrontation. The Saint is pleads desperately, her voice trembling with fear and confusion. The Flame Emperor sarcastically praises her acting skills and suggests that anyone who witnesses their interactions would believe her innocence. He shows a small bottle and claims that he has poisoned the drink she has just drunk. He explains that he has put a substance called basilisk stomach acid in it. He accuses her of intending to drink the drink herself, leaving her startled and anxious. He throws down the bottle, feeling a wave of relief wash over him. Without this, he would have been in serious trouble. The saint shudders, explaining that it was all just a big misunderstanding. She expresses her desire to team up with the Flame Emperor in order to dismantle the tower. He chuckles, admitting that he had also entertained the same idea, but it turned out to be incorrect. He asks the saint to clarify the misunderstanding, hoping to clear things up. Standing there, our lad's heart races as he tries to make sense of what is happening. He has always assumed that the Flame Emperor and the Saint are in a relationship, but their current conversation is different from what couples often talk about. With a smirk on his face, the Fire Emperor tightly squeezes the girl's throat, asserting his superiority. He lets her speak, but it is clear that he sets the rules of the conversation. Our boy's mind races, trying to comprehend the situation. He watches the dangerous exchange unfolding in front of him, his hand covering his mouth and sweat pouring down his face. Thoughts swarm in his head, realizing that this is more than just a conversation between two individuals. It's a blood-chilling clash between the one seeking to kill and the one fighting for survival. The Flame Emperor seizes control of the situation, his tone cold and calculating. He compels the saint to obey him, demanding honest answers to his questions. He informs her that he possesses the ability to detect lies, emphasizing that he demands the truth. Only when she confesses will he provide her with the antidote. Her questions whether she was sent by the Black Dragon Sorceress to assassinate him. The MC recalls the discussions about the Flame Emperor, noting that despite his numerous accomplishments, his attitude remained unchanged. While the Saint stays quiet, avoiding making eye contact, and gazes off into the distance. The Flame Emperor's anger intensifies as he interpreted her silence as a mistake. He wasn't the hero humanity was looking for. Unsatisfied with her response, his hand emitted a red, ominous light as he made his intentions known and says goodbye to the saint. The sound of a piercing scream echoed through the air, marking the end of the Saint Isabel's life. Our lad is filled with horror as he witnesses this horrifying scene, realizing that the man he once idolized as a hero has revealed his dark and merciless side. Numerous thoughts race through his mind as he runs, cursing the Flame Emperor as a murderer and a psychopath. He desperately tries to distance himself as much as possible. Unfortunately, Fate intervenes, abruptly ending his escape when he unintentionally steps on a glass bottle, causing it to shatter into pieces. The Flame Emperor emerges from around the corner, causing him to feel a sense of horror. His gaze is fixed on our MC, and his icy words cut through the air. With an evil smile, the Flame Emperor tells him that he seems to be the last rat in the area. As our scared lad locks eyes with the Fire Emperor, he notices the gaze, resembling that of a murderer. The Flame Emperor is chasing after him holding a burning flame in his hand. He realizes that the saint is not the first victim. How many lives has the flame emperor taken? Dozens, hundreds, or maybe more? He loses his balance from the surprise and falls to the ground. Only then does he realize the horrifying truth that his own injured leg lies right in front of him. The flame emperor approaches him with a burning weapon. Our lad begs for mercy, desperately trying to save his life. The flame emperor asks him why he ran as he's still pleading with him for his life. With a devilish smirk, the Flame Emperor asks him if he has seen him killing the saint. MC makes no effort to hide his innocence and mumbles that he has seen nothing. The Flame Emperor is intrigued by the reaction and questions him further about what he has not seen. Arlat assures him that he has seen nothing and promises not to tell anyone. The Flame Emperor sits down next to him and asks him what he was doing. He claims that he has called him Flame Emperor and that he has not seen something he should not have seen. 
The so-called hero expresses disbelief and says he almost believed our lad's words like a complete moron. Our MC blanches, begging him not to tell anyone and asking for mercy. He looks at the Flame Emperor and is forced to see him as a demon, as he smiles evilly and threatens our lad that if he refuses, he will suffer the same fate as the saint. He wonders who has sent our innocent boy, and if he is related to the Black Dragon. Our boy musters up the courage to talk about the Flame Emperor's claim that he has the ability to recognize lies. He says with a trembling voice that if he uses this skill, it will show that he is not an agent. However, the Flame Emperor asks him what the skill of recognizing lies is. Our protagonist is stunned and asks him with teary eyes if he has killed the saint simply on suspicion, without any proof. He responds with angrily screams, asking him what kind of person he thinks he is. He grips the MC by the throat, and flatly denying the accusation, saying that saint planned to kill him and poison the next day. Our lad expresses surprise at the Flame Emperor's knowledge, and asks how he knows that. He simply responds that he has his own way of doing things. He then tells the boy that since he is crying about the lie detector, he thinks of him being innocent. MC thanks him for believing in him. The Flame Emperor places his hand on his head, a hand with a red glow and a bloodthirsty smile. He declares that now that our lad has seen everything, he needs to die. While saying goodbye to him, the Flame Emperor calls out his real name, Yusua. MC remembers the words of the Headmaster, who reminds him that since his name is Kim Gungja, he should live up to his name. Gungja known as Confucius in Korean. He smiles and reaffirms his determination to honor his name. On the brink of death, he finds it undesirable to meet his end in such a manner. Suddenly, news of his demise arrives. He wonders why he must perish in this manner. He laments his way of life. Suddenly, he hears that his death has fulfilled the skill requirement and is now generating a skill card. He is driven by the desire to achieve a better fate. A notification pops up, informing him that the system is currently copying Yusua's skill entirely. Another notification appears, letting him know about the creation of a skill card. Unaware of this, he ponders with teary eyes, feeling that he deserved a bit more. Suddenly, he notices a golden card in front of him, urging him to choose a skill card. With desperate hope for new possibilities, he reaches out and grabs the gold card, wondering what it may bring. Gungja picks up the item and a message appears, indicating that the selection has been completed and the skill has been copied. Suddenly, he wakes up in bed, feeling shocked by what is happening. He is soon stunned by the sound of the news coming from his laptop. Upon hearing that the Black Dragon Guild is set on clearing floor 40, going, Jaws' heart races with excitement and anticipation. They are determined to showcase their top skills, but they keep coming back empty-handed. He is even more shocked and stunned by the unexpected turn of events, unable to help but voice his bewilderment as he wonders what is really going on. He looks shocked, wondering what is happening and when did he return home. Quickly, he grabs his cell phone to check for any news or updates on the hunting network chats. As he scrolls through, he notices all the news and discussions about the Flame Emperor are from yesterday. Surprised, he realizes that all of this took place just the day before. He had been certain that he had died only moments ago. Without hesitation, he summons two skill cards, revealing the single phrase skill card. The initial card displays a seemingly pointless skill named, I Wanna Be You. As he examines the second skill card, he ponders whether he acquired Flame Emperor's skill upon his demise. This skill, known as the Clockwork Return Mechanism, possesses an extraordinary ranking of EX. Gungja's astonishment intensifies when he comprehends that this skill enables him to go back 24 hours before his death retaining memories and abilities. However, the penalty escalates as the hunter's level rises. This skill is a direct copy from the hunter Yusua. He's completely taken aback by the fact that he has returned 24 hours before his death, still possessing all his abilities and memories. He can't help but wonder if this newfound power is some sort of legendary ability that only hunters possess. He is deep in thought, contemplating whether he killed Saintus as he knew. And sure enough, she would have poisoned him the day after. Gungja feels a surge of anger despite his innocence. He is the victim of the Flame Emperor's conspiracy. He shifts his gaze to the laptop where an interview with the Flame Emperor is in. Progress. The reporter asks him to tell the secret of his success in a few words to which he replies that whoever is destined to succeed will succeed, but one has to be careful not to get in the way as it will lead to death. Gung. Ja clenches his fists, feeling the injustice of it all. Gungja, fueled by determination and a thirst for revenge, decides to see that who would meet therein this time. Suddenly, a loud scream interrupts his thoughts. A great fire breaks out, 
causing panic as people rush to fill buckets with water and extinguish the flames. Gungja steps outside and observes that the place where they live is unlike the outside world. Cities are constructed by ambitious tower hunters, trapping residents within their walls. The realization dawns on him that escape is no longer an option. He rushes to the scene of the fire and realizes it is the same time he had been drinking. He realizes that the Flame Emperor has set the building on fire to cover up the evidence of his actions and create chaos and confusion. The head of the Black Dragon Guild, Black Witch, orders the water users to use their skills together and time them perfectly. They ask the citizens to cooperate with them as they temporarily take control of the situation, ensuring everyone's safety. The Black Dragon Guild leader is the one who orders them. This city of theirs has many names. Guild members are determined to extinguish the fire and assist the survivors. The Rank 5 Alchemist leader of the Healers and Apothecaries Guild guards the perimeter and worries about the survivors who are still inside. Their city is known as Babylon or the first floor city where rescuers are urgently needed to save the survivors. The situation is dire, but they are all working together to make a difference. Captain Holly Knight, leading the city organization, assures everyone that no one has been living in the area for five years amidst the commotion. Babylon, the city of the second floor, the city of lanterns, but regardless of the name, the essence remains unchanged. It is the city you cannot escape once you step foot in. Calls for additional extinguishers and more water users with abilities echo through the air. The townspeople cannot escape the ordeal of the towers where they live in extreme danger. The alchemist notices the sacred saint's absence and ponders over the situation, wondering what could be keeping the saint away from their usual duties. The holy knight informs her that the saint has important business tonight. He considers the possibility that maybe she is on a date or meeting with the flame emperor, as she often meets with him. The alchemist expresses her distrust of the flame emperor because she always has a bad feeling about him. Suddenly, the fire emperor appears and asks with a smirk on his face, who it is that is playing with fire without permission. Gungja is shocked to see the flame emperor on the scene. The holy knight greets the flame emperor, who responds to him with a smile, acknowledging his presence. Everyone is taking advantage of this opportunity and tapping on their phones to record the flame emperor. Knight seizes the chance to seek his assistance in extinguishing the fire that has consumed the slum area. The Flame Emperor grins, and counters with a query, questioning what he would gain in exchange. Gungja's grip on the knife tightens as he realizes that this shameless individual, the Flame Emperor, audaciously demands a reward for putting out the very fire he ignited. The Holy Knight attempts to sway the Fire Emperor's mindset by highlighting the praiseworthy nature of his good deeds. However, he bluntly expresses his indifference towards others' opinions. Gungja recalls the comments from the Fire Emperor's supporters who view him as a hero. As the Fire Emperor departs, he makes it clear that he is not involved in public affairs. Gungja is determined to confront the Flame Emperor and destroy him. He realizes that despite his disgusting character, the people regard the Flame Emperor as a legendary figure. Gungja believes that no one knows the true nature of the Flame Emperor but they disregard it and consider him a hero with eccentric features. Only he knows the harsh reality behind the killer's face, and he feels responsible for killing him. Gungja is now preparing himself for the ultimate showdown. He chases after the flame hunter, despite people's attempts to prevent him from going there due to the danger involved. However, he remains resolute in his mission to defeat the flame hunter in order to protect humanity and uphold the honor of the hunters. Hunters are individuals who eliminate monsters without considering the methods or means employed. As Gungja gets closer to the Flame Emperor, he anxiously warns him to carefully watch his path. Gungja moves forward, his unwavering belief is that the monster deserves demise regardless of any personal danger or method used. But instead of launching an attack on the Flame Emperor, he fearlessly throws himself into the raging fire. Everyone attempts to halt him, even the Flame Emperor gazes at him with a mix of astonishment and bewilderment. Gungja feels the intense heat and burns all over his body, crying out in pain. Those around him watch in shock as he endures the scorching heat. He knows that sacrificing himself is the only way to defeat this monster. Suddenly, a message appears in front of him stating that he is dead, followed by going back 24 hours. When he regains consciousness, he finds himself in the past, and his laptop displaying the latest news about the Black Dragon Guild's attack on the 40th floor of the building. He feels relieved as he sees his skills working correctly, bringing him back in time. A message pops up, indicating that the hunter's current rank is F. However, there are no penalties this time. 
He wonders how a low ranker like himself isn't facing any penalties. He understands that it's impossible to defeat the Fire Emperor right now, even if he's lucky. The Fire Emperor possesses a similar skill that enables him to turn back time 24 hours. Gungja contemplates his next move carefully. So, as a low-ranking hunter, he has only one option to locate this man. Fueled by his determination, he remembers his awakening when he faced the Flame Emperor. He recalls when the interviewer asked about the precise time of the awakening, the Fire Emperor confidently responded that he awakened approximately 11 years ago during the summer of the 21st year. The interviewer commends his exceptional memory, impressed by his ability to recall every detail. The Flame Emperor revealed that the awakening happened on his birthday, June 7th. According to Gungja, the Flame Emperor has already awakened 4,000 days prior to the present. Faced with a daunting task, he realizes that he must undergo death 4,000 times to obtain the Flame Emperor before its awakening. Holding a knife in his hand, Gungja makes the decision to end his life. As he is near to death, a message suddenly appears before his eyes, showing his impending demise. In a twist of fate, he is transported back to the events of the past 24 hours. As he awakens once more, his gaze falls upon the gleaming knife, and a startling realization dawns upon him. He now has a mere 39,999 days left to fulfill his mission. Determined by the weight of his task, he embarks on a countless cycle of self-inflicted deaths, meeting his demise countless times. He travels through time each time, not getting penalty for using his abilities due to his low rank as a hunter. With each death, the number of days left decreases, first to 2,000, then to 525 days. Despite this, he stubbornly continues to persevere. Finally, with a smile on his face, he realizes that today is his last day. He is ready to meet his destiny. As he prepared to meet his destiny, he finally got the chance to come face to face with the Flame Emperor. Waking up in his bedroom, he gets out of bed and looks at the blank wall where numerous news articles about the Flame Emperor had once hung. It's a clear sign that his plan had succeeded. He had returned to a time when the legend of the Flame Emperor had not yet been written. Sighing, he realized that he had died 30 times more than he had originally planned, given the time it took him to commit suicide and everything else in between. He survived the ordeal so that his demonic legacy would not live on. Full of determination, Gonja leaves his room just when it is time to look for prey. Eleven years ago on May 6th at 11 o'clock in the morning, he saw the Flame Emperor lying in his bed with his alarm clock ringing. He had a headache from drinking too much. Our lad planned to repeat the day about 10 times to get the perfect result. At 9 a.m., the Fire Emperor wakes up and leaves the F rank hunter's apartment. He goes to work, expressing dissatisfaction with his miserable life. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he hunts slimes on the first floor of the tower. Gongja realizes that the Flame Emperor is tired of this daily routine and yearns for a life of luxury like the Sword King. For 21 years, he has been an ordinary F rated hunter waiting for his life to change for the better. He wishes to win a lottery or get an S-rank skill. Our MC understands that normally he would have gotten his wish fulfilled in a week, but now he knows that the future won't align with the Flame Emperor's desires. To disguise himself, he kills a red slime and covers his body with its gooey liquid, preparing for the next stage of his plan. At 5.30 in the evening, the Flame Emperor ascends to the sixth floor, pondering that he can't just hunt slimes anymore. Yun Suha ventures into a more challenging area where beginner hunters don't usually go. Gongja knows that for the next 36 minutes there's no one else around but the Flame Emperor. With a determined look, he approaches the Flame Emperor covered in red slime and asks for help, claiming to have been attacked by a wolf and needing medicine. The Flame Emperor scrutinizes him and asks if he actually touched the monsters. He announced that today's hunt is over. Gongja is still begging for healing potion. The Flame Emperor gets frustrated and tells him that he can't even fill his daily quota, and questions how much he's going to pay him in return. Gongja offers apologies, struggling to understand the situation at hand. The Flame Emperor expresses frustration, citing his ongoing struggle to secure enough daily provisions and the inability to afford costly potions. He questions the rationale behind providing expensive medicine to a stranger. Gongja tries to persuade the Flame Emperor by mentioning that the Chemist Guild prices the medicine at 20 gold a sum he is prepared to pay. However, the Flame Emperor interrupts, implying that if Gongja can only offer 20 gold, he might not be valuing his own life highly enough. Doubting Gongja's self-worth, the Flame Emperor hesitates. Despite this, Gongja remains determined to obtain the cure and raises his offer to 40 gold, unwilling to let this opportunity slip away. 
The Flame Emperor nods in approval and insists that Gongja hands over all the money. Seizing him by the collar, the Flame Emperor confiscates his wallet, stating he will handle the transaction himself and suspecting Gongja of exploiting others' finances. Upon examining the wallet's contents, the Flame Emperor realizes Gongja is quite impoverished. He insists to the Flame Emperor that the money represents his entire fortune. He smirks in response, assuring Gongja that he will use the money for its intended purpose. However, when our lad requests potion, the Flame Emperor as expected retrieves a weapon from his inventory, fearing potential revenge if Gongja is released. He declares his desire to live without regrets and insists that our MC must die because he has seen his face. With determination, the Flame Emperor moves to attack our lad, intending to kill him on the spot. Reacting swiftly, Gongja dodges the attack and retaliates by striking back with his foot at the Flame Emperor. Fueled by his determination to live without regrets, he grabs his knife and rushes to counterattack, believing he cannot allow a life-threatening incident to trigger the Flame Emperor's awakening. With a fierce resolve to destroy him forever and put an end to the chaos, Gongja viciously attacks the half-dead and unconscious Flame Emperor with his knife. He explodes with anger, screaming at Yusua for the pain he has caused. He had a moment of realization after 4,090 days, he has recognized that Sua was merely pretending to be a knight in what he thought was a sacred duel. Writhing in anger and disbelief at his actions, Gongja questions how he could pretend to be a knight after causing so much harm. Turning away from the scene, Gongja spots a pack of red wolves nearby and offers to let them feast on the corpse of the flame emperor. As the wolves begin their meal, he continues on his way. Walking further, he uncovers his hidden bag from beneath the grass and changes into fresh clothes, burying the dirty ones in the ground. He prepares himself mentally as he ascends to the first floor, wondering if the ordeal is truly over. Upon reaching the designated area, he finds himself teleported back to the first floor. Feeling a twinge of nervousness and overwhelmed by fear and a sense of foreboding, Gongja notices a knight patrolling heading for the exit. They both assume the same stance, causing Gongja's anxiety to spike. However, to his surprise, the knight passes by without noticing him. It dawns on him that nobody knows what truly transpired. The truth about his confrontation with the Flame Emperor and his subsequent revenge remains concealed. A wave of relief and a sense of completion washes over him. At the bar, he overhears on the TV that the raid on the 10th floor failed once again. The Sword King, the top-ranked hunter, has been conspicuously absent from these endeavors, leading to increasing criticism against him. Despite this, Gongja feels joy and relief knowing that the menacing legend of the Flame Emperor has been eradicated from the world. He calls the waiter over and orders more beer to celebrate his victory. Observing Gongja's enthusiasm, the waiter inquires if his hunt for the day has been successful. Meanwhile, in the background, the news reports that all top-ranking hunters attempted to clear floor 10 but failed, sparking debates about the effectiveness of the ranking system. As Gongja examines his hunter abilities, he finds himself appreciating his skills even more, enhancing the taste of his drink. Impressed with his capabilities, he acknowledges a deficiency in offensive power. Contemplating whether his desire for more is rooted in greed, he questions the nature of human existence. Yet, he reminds himself that with his current skills, he still holds the potential for great achievements. Considering various avenues for his future, he entertains the idea of leveraging his abilities to win the trade guild lottery or selling valuable information about the secrets of the upper floors. Feeling a significant shift in his life, he embraces the prospect of living fully. Encouraged by this newfound determination, he contemplates his next steps and eagerly anticipates the opportunities unfolding before him. Suddenly, an elderly man enters the bar. Serenely, the old man orders a drink and requests warm milk with vodka and a hint of sugar, suggesting honey as a preferable alternative. Gongja, taken aback, informs the old man that he is not the bartender. Inwardly, he perceives the old man as eccentric. Nevertheless, the old guy reassures him not to worry, promising extra payment. Observing the old man, he senses an air of influence surrounding him, prompting him to speculate about the man's significance. He turns his attention to the television news. The news anchor emphasizes the need for hunters to unite, especially in difficult times, and inquires about the location and activities of the Sacred Sword. To his surprise, the figure of the Holy Sword shown on television turns out to be none other than an old man, sitting in the same bar as him. This discovery intrigues Gongja, and he wants to find out who the Holy Sword is and what its purpose is. Marcus Callenberry, 
known as the Sword King, has been missing for the past 22 days, leaving a significant void in the Hunters' Association. Despite his absence, Marcus was forgotten after 11 years of reigning at the top of the rankings. His prominence dwindled once the Flame Emperor rose to fame. Gongja keeps a close watch on the reputation of the Holy Sword, wondering if it possesses formidable skills, perhaps even reaching S rank, unlike his soul skill. Envious of the Sword King's prowess, he yearns to emulate him, imagining the ability to mimic the movements of any hunter attempting to kill him, even if they were the top-ranked hunter of their era. With this power, he is confident that he could never die again, believing firmly in his capacity for greatness. Delving into research about the Sword King online, Gongja discovers that Marcus hails from a wealthy family background, yet his actual skills remain shrouded in mystery. Despite having everything, Marcus chose to forsake it all to enter the tower, and he was known for his habit of talking to himself. Gongja muses over the enigmatic nature of the Sword King, finding little useful information about him. He reflects that it would be unfortunate if Marcus possessed even a fraction of the egotism displayed by the Flame Emperor. Suddenly, the Sword Saint speaks to himself in a loud voice, ordering someone to cover their mouth and not be so loud. Surprised by this encounter, Gongja realizes that the Sword Saint is indeed talking to himself and wonders if this often happens to high-ranking hunters and there is something wrong with them. His attention is drawn to an article titled, Warning, You Should Never Speak in Front of the Sword King. The author mentions that he has seen it with his own eyes and if you do not want to die then never say this to the Sword King. The author claims to have witnessed a situation where several high-ranking hunters began to accuse and provoke the Holy Sword. They provoked him by saying something offensive and abused him. However, the situation took an extremely dangerous turn when they mentioned the grandchildren of the Holy Sword. He loses his calm and instantly attacks them resulting in their instant death at the hands of the Holy Sword. It is shocking that the Sword King really killed a human. Readers have doubts, suspecting that the author works for a large guild and is just spreading rumors. Not afraid of the skeptics, the author replies that he doesn't care if they believe him or not. He just wants to share information and warns readers that if they want to avoid a similar fate, they should never mention the grandchildren of the Holy Sword in his presence. After reading the article, our lad takes the information to heart and decides he should remember never to say that word in front of him. As he notices the Sword King, he hears him talking to himself, demanding silence and expressing his willingness to process something while complaining that his presence is spoiling the flavor of the vodka. Gongja ponders that testing the information about the Sword King was worth it. After paying the bill, he thanks the drinks and leaves the restaurant. On his way out, the waiter wishes him a nice day. One of the girls in the bar expresses relief that he has finally left, while her companion wonders if the Holy Sword is suffering from dementia and why he is talking to himself. When Gongja hears the Holy Sword leaving, he also gets up, thanks the waiter, and hands him the money. The waiter thanks him and tells him to come again. He leaves the bar, determined to find the Holy Sword, rank 100. Gongja ponders that he left the bar right behind him, so he must not have gotten very far. And finally, his eyes catch a glimpse of the Sword King from behind. Because he is the only one who dresses like this in the whole of Babylon, so it's not hard to find him. He wonders what kind of feats the Holy Sword could possess. He thinks that it might have a more amazing technique than the rare X-rank Flame Emperor's technique. He ponders that he must have a high rank skill as a guy who is top in this generation. Maybe he has something better than returning to the past. Gongja, despite being anxious, harbors hopes of acquiring this skill for himself, while his lucky streak continues. However, the Sword Saint suddenly stops and shouts loudly for him to get down. Gongja is surprised and realizes that Marcus has instantly detected his presence. The Sword Saint tells him that he is in the right place and adds that no one knows will know what happens here. Gongja turns around and addresses the Sword Saint politely, stating that he has a request. Surprised at his approach, the Sword Saint doubts his intentions and inquires why he followed him here and addressed him thus. He asks him what he wants from an old man that he came at him like this. Gongja is puzzled, thinking that the Sword King thinks that he purposely let him notice him. Our lad is now a little concerned as he is not even armed. He is dumbfounded when he realizes that the Sword Saint seems to be preparing to attack. His thoughts are filled with confusion as he has done nothing wrong except following him. But he feels that it's actually better for him to die just like that. At that moment, the Sword Saint appreciates Gong Jia's acting ability and says that he is a first-class assassin. He trembles with fear, apologizes, and expresses his confusion. 
He inwardly wonders why the sword saint would think that but realizes that he doesn't even need to be provoked by the mention of his grandsons to die from his hands. Gongja mutters an apology and denies that he intentionally followed him. The sword saint expresses his contempt and disgust at Gongja's behavior, stating that he came all the way here and is still acting. He accuses our boy of trying to deceive him but says that his efforts have been in vain. Gongja gathers the courage to approach the sword saint and ask for an explanation. He doesn't understand why the sword saint considers him a first-class assassin even though he appears ordinary and unremarkable. The sword saint draws his sword and silences Gongja, saying that he has several techniques, some of which indicate the number of people someone has killed. Gongja ponders that he had a reason for his actions, but murder is murder. He killed the flame emperor to prevent him from becoming a future monster. However, he realizes that in front of the people of the present, his act is not justified. He imagines that the sword saint sees the number one above his head, signifying one murder he has committed. He begs the holy sword to listen to him and explain everything, that he had a good reason for his actions and is willing to swear even on his own life. But the sword king still finds him a disgusting demon who has taken many lives and is still trying to put a value on his life. He takes off his hat and admits that he himself has not led a clean life and insists that he has not participated in such ruthless murders as Gong Jia describes. Stunned, Gong Jia says that he has killed only one man. However, the sword saint points his sword at Gong Ya and accuses him of shamelessly lying. According to the sacred sword, the number of men killed by Gong Ya is much higher. The count of people killed by him is 4,091. Gong Ya observes the number 4,091 displayed above his head. He comprehends that the number one signifies the flame emperor's assassination, and 4,090 indicates the number of his suicides. According to the Sacred Sword, Gongja is a legendary assassin with 4,091 deaths to his credit. The Sword Saint inquires if the Black Dragon which has sent him. Gongja panics, dashes away, and the Sword Saint remains pensive without an answer. Gongja realizes that the situation transcends copying techniques as long as he possesses this special skill. Whenever the Sword Saint sees Gongja, he will attempt to kill him. The Sword Saint following him, swings his sword at him, and resolves to utilize all his power to end his life, branding him a demon. He continues to dodge the Holy Sword's attacks, surprising him, and prompting him to praise Gongja as a first-class assassin. Our lad frustratingly ponders if the old man is deaf, and tries to run away. As he runs, suddenly he stumbles upon a stone and falls to the ground. He is now unable to get up and ponders that he was lucky enough to get through the first attack. Now he realizes that he can't dodge forever, so he prepares himself for the inevitable confrontation. As the impending attack draws near, Gongja readies himself for what lies ahead. Suddenly, the sword saint declares that he must apprehend Gongja for questioning. He insists on handling the matter personally and instructs the other party to cease their interference. Observing the sword saint seemingly conversing with himself, Gongja deems the exchange too genuine to dismiss as mere delusion. He contemplates whether conversing with oneself could be considered a skill, pondering the notion that the sword saint may be utilizing telepathic methods to communicate. Aware of such abilities existing in the world, he surmises that disclosing his knowledge could lead to the killer being held accountable for the deaths of 491 individuals. Anticipating being pursued by hunting organizations, targeted by prominent guilds, and sought after by elite hunters, he dreads becoming the most wanted man and facing public execution in Babylon Square. Fearing this outcome, he resolves that he must act swiftly to avert such a fate, believing that his demise within 24 hours is necessary to alter the course of events. Despite any opposition, the elderly man remains resolute in his decision. Rising with determination, Gongja implores the Holy Sword to safeguard his grandchildren, highlighting the potential risks they face as members of a wealthy European lineage. He subtly alludes to the perils of the outside world and expresses confidence in his descendants' upbringing due to their inherited bloodline. The holy sword is raised, and Gonja's gaze turns to the moon. He marvels at its beauty and wonders if the moon has always been so upside down. He adores the beauty of the moon. At that moment, he doesn't even feel the blow of the holy sword, overwhelmed with desire. He wants to become just like the holy sword and wonders how he could reach such heights. He feels a strong sense of envy and expresses a desire to possess the same level of skill and strength. When Gonja's life ends, the message of his death appears, and by fulfilling the skill requirements, his skill card has been created. A skill map gets created, and he feels ecstatic, believing he has managed to acquire the skills of a rank 1 hunter from two different eras. 
However, when asked to choose a skill card, he searches for a gold card, only to be disappointed by the absence of any. They only offer bronze and silver cards. He had anticipated gold cards similar to those he obtained from the Flame Emperor. He wonders if the Sword King Marcus Calinari, the legend preceding the Flame Emperor, could have reached the top on his own without S-ranking ability. He doubts the possibility. Nonetheless, he decides that the silver cards might contain superpowered abilities. He despises the inferior bronze-colored ones and notices four silver cards. Ignoring the three copper ones, Gongja selects one of the four silver cards. However, the probability of that happening is only one in four. In his choice, he avoids a mediocre skill like counting kills. He desperately needs a strong ability. He craves something extraordinary. He picks a silver card and pleads for an exceptional skill to emerge. Upon selecting a card, a message appears stating that the skill will be copied and revert to a time 24 hours ago. Confused, he wakes up in bed and promptly opens the hunter's ability window. He eagerly searches for the psychic skills that he believed he had acquired. To his surprise, Gongja discovers the sword constellation skill. Although he acknowledges his A plus rank skills are still commendable, he favors unconventional martial arts and aura awakening classes. He cannot help but feel a thirst for more powerful abilities. Lying in bed, he reflects on the fact that the skills he has acquired are passive. Nevertheless, he consoles himself with his A plus rank. Gongya's curiosity takes over, and he contemplates the open skill card. He realizes that the name of the skill alone doesn't reveal much about its effect. Suddenly, his thoughts are interrupted by a voice asking who's speaking so loudly. Gongja turns to the side and sees a red-haired man lying on his back. The man calls him an old man, scolds him for making noise during night, and asks him to keep quiet. Gongja's face contorts with confusion and disbelief as he struggles to understand the identity of the red-haired man before him. Expressing his frustration, Red reminds him to be quiet during the evening training sessions, emphasizing the need not to disturb as he naturally follows him when he moves. Stunned by this conversation, Gongja asks the red-haired man who he is. To his surprise, the red-haired man questions in response, asking Gongja if he can see him and hear his voice. Gongja responds that he senses the redhead's presence as they are conversing. Puzzled, the red-haired man stands up and comments on the strangeness of being seen and heard. He then asks where they are, surprised by the small size of the place, likening it to a dog box. He also inquires about the old man's whereabouts. Gongja curiously asks if he's referring to the Holy Sword King. The red-haired man confirms this, admitting that it might be foolish to call a novice a saint, but as that's what they call him all over the world, he begins looking for him. Gongja incredulously asks if Marcus is truly a novice. The red-haired guy looks out the window and complains about the limited view. Gongja checks the red-haired man's information and discovers he's a sore master from another world. He had reached the 99th floor of the Tower of His World but was defeated before reaching the 100th floor. Out of resentment, he turned into a wandering spirit that could not physically interact with the current world but could mentally communicate with capable people and offer advice based on his vast knowledge and experience. However, only capable people can perceive and communicate with him. Gongja thinks for a moment and concludes that the red-haired man is a ghost. Curious, he asks the red-haired man if he's the spirit associated with the sacred sword saint. As if to confirm Gongja's suspicions, the spirit admits that he's the spirit of the sword. Gongja apologizes, explaining that he accidentally copied it from the holy sword. The sword spirit, unable to believe his eyes, opens his mouth wide and demands to be handed over to the old man immediately. The spirit tells him that if he copied him, he can be returned by canceling him, insisting Gongja refund him. The spirit is so moved that it cries and begs Gongja to cancel its potential and take everything back. Gongja feels helpless, covering his ears and explaining that the situation cannot be changed. In despair, the sword spirit sits upside down on the roof of the room and scolds the holy sword, calling it a failure for being stolen so easily by the enemy. Gongja tells him not to cry upside down as it frightens him. The spirit still accuses the old man of not taking care of his precious teacher. Gongja, frightened by the sword spirit's cries, asks him to live peacefully. The sword spirit responds that he cannot find peace as he is already deceased. Gongja, feeling desperate, asks him to find some peace in death at least. In reply, the sword spirit continues to wail, accusing him of arrogance, pointing his finger at him, and expressing disbelief at Gongja's audacity to command the ghost to die once more. Gongja wonders why the sword spirit is so chatty and suddenly recalls the holy sword's habit of talking to itself 
and getting frustrated repeatedly. Then, he realizes it's because of the Spirit's presence. Disheartened, he complains that he'll have to hide from the Holy Sword for the rest of his life and bear the burden of accidentally copying techniques. The Sword Spirit questions why Gongja would want to hide from the Holy Sword, insisting that aside from his grandson, no hunter can match him. However, Gongja interrupts, saying he already knows, but he has the skill to see the number of people killed. The Sword Spirit labels it as Detective Insight, but Gongja interjects, calling it useless as it only indicates whether someone is a murderer or not. He shares about the 4,091 kills. The Sword Spirit looks at him with disdain, labeling Gongja as crazy and a newbie among newbies. He criticizes Gongja for lacking aura and asks how he managed to acquire 4,091 kills. Our poor lad explains that of the 4,091 people killed, only one is a real person who will become a future villain. The other 4090 he killed himself to activate his ability. His ability is to copy the skills of the person he kills, and the person he attacks possesses skills that allow them to return to the day before their death. Even if Gongja dies, he will go back to the day before his death. This practically makes him immortal, and one day he will die and return. His main motive is revenge, but his target, the number one hunter in their world and a man of rare skill, is too powerful for him to defeat. He then resolves to rewind time to the moment when this man awakened his power. Intrigued, the sword spirit questions his choice to rewind time solely for seeking revenge on one man and subjecting himself to a series of suicides over the next 11 years. Moving closer to him, the spirit asks for his name, to which Gongja responds promptly. Surprised, the sword spirit inquires why he opted to mimic the old man's technique right after seeking revenge on the flame emperor. Gongja explains that the old man was the top hunter of his time, and he needed to learn the strongest techniques to bolster his strength. The sword spirit acknowledges his honest response, noting that the skill card indicated only he could perceive them. Thus, there was no need to worry about sharing this information with anyone else. Gongja affirms this and confirms it to be true. Gesturing for Gongja to stand up and examine his body, the spirit compliments his exceptional determination, highlighting his good physical condition and admirable ambition. The sword spirit observes his potential and is impressed by his talent. Intrigued, the sword spirit requests Gongja to teach him how to hunt monsters. They reach a hunting ground filled with red slimes. Gongja inquires about the number of slimes he must eliminate, and the sword spirit replies with a few. Gongja commences hunting the slimes one by one, deftly using his knife. As he battles, the sword spirit closely monitors him. Eventually, the spirit confirms his intuition. Gongja expresses curiosity and questions the spirit about the intuition mentioned. The sword spirit reveals that in his previous life, he was recognized as the Emperor of Swords. He originated from another realm where there existed a tower akin to the current one. He brags about ascending the tower at an unparalleled pace. Reflecting on this revelation, Gongja comprehends that while the Flame Emperor reached the 40th floor and became a legend, the sword spirit ascended to the 99th floor. His achievement is commendable. Gongja acknowledges that he is just as skilled as the sword spirit, enabling him to perceive the spirit's greatness. The sword spirit holds the belief that a hunter's true talent can be measured by their behavior. To put our boy's skills to the test, the spirit requests a demonstration of his hunting abilities. He watches on, realizing that the spirit's expectations may be futile as he lacks combat skills. The spirit is puzzled by his modesty and fiercely denies his self-criticism, asserting that he possesses a remarkable talent. Gongja is taken aback by the spirit's praise, initially thinking it to be mockery. The spirit points out his shortcomings in fighting, noting his lackluster moves, average physique, and absence of an awakening aura. However, the spirit reveals that his unique talent lies in his fearlessness towards death. While most individuals instinctively defend themselves in battle, his fear of death has likely diminished after enduring 4,000 deaths. Gongja is taken aback, pondering whether the absence of fear could be seen as a unique skill. The sword spirit confidently states that talent is not an inherent trait, but rather something that is awakened throughout one's journey in life. Among all abilities, conquering the fear of death stands out as one of the most challenging and remarkable accomplishments. Gongja contemplates this insight, realizing that he has never heard such wisdom before, not even from himself. Initially seeking vengeance against the flame emperor who had wronged him, his rage led him to face death 4,000 times without hesitation. Now, he understands that death could be his ultimate freedom. The sword spirit inquires about Gongja's thoughts on his own demise at the hands of the elderly man. 
He responds by recalling the moment fondly, finding it to be quite beautiful. The sword spirit is taken aback by his answer and bursts into laughter. After laughing for a bit, the spirit expresses how amusing their situation is. Upon realizing that Gongja's talent lies in copying rather than stealing, the sword spirit suggests that the old man may have a duplicate of it. Curiosity ignites within him as he contemplates who the superior hunter is between Gongja and the sword saint. With unwavering confidence, the sword spirit vows to assist Gongja. He promises that our lad will not only defeat the old man but also surpass him in strength. Together, they will conquer the tower and strive for greater achievements. The sword spirit shouts loudly, waking Gonja from his sleep. Still half asleep, he lazily requests five more minutes. The sword spirit bristles with anger at this request, unable to comprehend how Gonja has the audacity to ask for additional time. It expresses disbelief that he would dare to stall, suggesting that the elderly man, stronger even than the revered sword saint, is likely already ascending the tenth floor, while Gonja remains in bed, cocooned under his pillow. With determination, it declares its intention to unleash the song of its homeland, boasting that its melody possesses the power to rupture the eardrums of 30 individuals simultaneously. It questions Gonja about his awareness of the time. Frustrated, he reluctantly rises from his bed and inquires about the time, displaying his cell phone which indicates 4 a.m. clearing its throat. The sword spirit dryly remarks that it's already 4 in the morning and the insects have begun their activities, insinuating that Gonja, seemingly weaker than the insects, should have awakened earlier. He retorts, suggesting that the sword spirit is merely restless due to its inability to sleep. The sword spirit visibly flinched upon hearing this remarks, but Gonja persisted, adding a touch of humor by stating that he had always pondered why the sword saint arose at four in the morning for training, not due to diligence, but rather because of the deafening noise created by the sword spirit. Acknowledging his jest, the sword spirit admitted that it did indeed awaken him out of boredom. It then humorously suggested that Gonja should express gratitude for the opportunity to wake up and train, prompting him to thank and praise the sword spirit with a bow. Gonja retorted, expressing his desire to kill the spirit. Unfazed, the sword spirit smirked, confidently stating that he couldn't possibly kill him. He taunted Gonja, suggesting that if jealousy consumed him, he should be the one to meet his demise. However, he quickly added that even if he desired death, he couldn't achieve it, playfully naming Gonja Zombie Kim from then on. Disheartened, he muttered irritably as he set out for his morning run. The sword spirit ever mischievous interrupted once again, affectionately calling him Zombie Kim. It emphasized that Gonja was only just beginning to gain determination. Ordinarily, a sword spirit would prefer to start teaching from the basics. However, in his case, the sword spirit felt they hadn't even begun yet, as he was not yet at any level and somehow seemed a tier below being able to learn the basics. Meanwhile, Gonja reflected on the four days that had passed since he had received the sword master skill from the Holy Sword. During this time, he had managed to defeat the Flame Emperor and successfully avoided encounters with the Holy Sword. Observing his abilities, the Sword Spirit realized he possessed the power of the Infinite Void, which struck the Sword Spirit as incredibly cool, leading to an expression of jealousy. Exhausted from running, Gonja pleaded with the Sword Spirit not to bother him any longer. He was currently adhering to the training routine set by the Guardian Spirit. However, the Sword Spirit intervened, insisting that he needed special training and jokingly mentioning a high registration fee. Further joking, the Sword Spirit suggested they go and try their luck by winning the lottery in the tower. There's a guild called Trade Guild Sang Rian, also known as Alliance. The leader, who's a third-class hunter, named Countess, what distinguished her is a distinctive skill she possessed, enabling the trade of goods from the external world. This skill gave the Merchant Corps complete control in the tower, making it the only place where people could buy lottery tickets in Babylon. Upon their arrival at the trading company, a staff member wearing a hat adorned with cat ears warmly welcomed them and inquired about their needs. Gonja presented his lottery ticket, stating his intention to claim his prize. The staff member inspected the ticket and enthusiastically informed him that he had won the trading company troop lottery, extending congratulations. Intrigued, the sword spirit inquired about the employee who consistently wore a hat with cat ears. Gonja clarified that he had heard rumors suggesting that the guild leader was fond of cats. The sword spirit humorously remarked that while she may love cats, it would be rather eccentric for her to compel a regular person to don cat ears. The employee confirmed that the ticket could not be redeemed for two years from the purchase date, 
advising Gonja to verify the date. After acquiring the Guardian Spirit, he purchased the lottery ticket. He reassures the employee that the ticket was bought just last week. Believing that winning the lottery is a necessity, especially given the Sword Spirit's mention of needing money, he hopes for success. The employee smiles and requests to verify his identification. However, upon glimpsing the ticket, he is taken aback, exclaiming in shock that it's the first prize. The Sword Spirit enthusiastically observes how effortless it appears to make money. The employee quickly inspects the room and requests some time to fetch his boss. Ganja agrees, advising the employee to take all the time he needs. The Sword Spirit interjects with a cautionary note about the potential risks of being robbed and confined in dimly lit spaces. Ganja responds, recalling how the Flame Emperor had utilized his abilities to secure a lottery win. He emphasizes that attempts to conceal the prize would be futile, hence it's safer to announce the winnings publicly. He underscores the potential repercussions, stating that if the winner were to be harmed, it would severely tarnish the reputation of the trade organization. The director arrives, offering greetings to the group and expressing gratitude for their patience. He introduces himself as Arthur Taylor, the safety guardian, and requests to be addressed as such. Gonja reacts to the introduction, noting the aptness of his nickname for the guild. He deduces that the fact the director has a nickname indicates he must be a hunter of at least rank 300. The supervisor acknowledges Gonja's observation with a grin, affirming that he often receives similar remarks. He then invites Gonja upstairs. Normally, he doesn't think he can challenge someone in charge, but not today. After receiving 50,000 gold, he regains his confidence. Seeing the happy expression on his face, the sword spirit comments on his easily disposable happiness, implying that he has never been treated so well before. The sword spirit remembers how happy he was when it told him that he had a talent for dying. A nervous Gonja orders it to be silent. The supervisor expressed relief, noting that Gonja didn't look good earlier and was concerned that perhaps he had crossed a line. Gonja has no way of knowing if the boss is an angel, but the sword spirit watches his actions and notes how easily doubt could be planted on him. The supervisor leads him to a door, explaining that this is the VIP lounge. Opening the door, he reveals the first place prize that he has won, 53,000 gold pieces. He is shocked to look at the gold and realizes that in his homeland, it equals about $5 million. With that kind of money, he could live like a king. The boss offers him a choice, either take all the money or keep it in the safe of the guild. He thinks about it, realizing that if he had aspired to succeed, he would have achieved his dream by now. He ponders his decision, thinking about his goal to conquer the tower and reach the top as a hunter. He realizes that money serves merely as a means to an end, and he perceives a more captivating golden light than that of gold coins. He opts to leave the money with the trade troop. Arthur commends him for making the right decision, asserting that he personally advocates this option for its safety. He explains the potential risks involved in possessing such a substantial amount of money, especially in the presence of nefarious individuals. However, Gonja interrupts him with a smile and expresses his desire to purchase an honorary guild membership title. He queries whether a second-level honorary membership, priced at 10,000 gold, is a worthwhile investment and offers to make the payment promptly. Arthur expresses surprise and inquires if Gonja is affiliated with any other guild, to which Gonja reassures him that he is not. The Sword Spirit commends Gonja's wisdom, acknowledging that a guild serves as more than just a social association of hunters. He explains that one of the primary motivations for hunters to join guilds is for protection, a fact Gonja comprehends well. He reflects on the presence of guards and the hunter association but acknowledges the prevalence of lawlessness in the city. Relying solely on the guild and a group of hunters may not suffice in such an environment. Contemplating the cases of the Flame Emperor and the Sword Saint, he realizes that they killed him. The Flame Emperor, in particular, never aligned himself with guilds and lived according to his own pride. Despite winning the lottery twice, he likely never invested in protection services. The Flame Emperor's decision to reject all guilds resulted in him isolating himself from the most influential ones, which eventually put him at risk of being poisoned. Realizing the negative outcomes of antagonizing the leading guilds, he makes a firm resolution to avoid going down the same path. He discloses that he currently lives in a small and humble one-room house and asks for the guild's help in finding a more suitable place to live. He also requests the manager to notify any curious newspapers that the recipient of the top raffle prize is now an esteemed member of the Sang Ryan Guild. When the director witnesses how meticulously Gonja handles the situation, his face becomes stern, 
indicating his understanding that Ganja is prepared. The sword spirit tells Ganja that the boss's original intention to underestimate him is not working. Ganja replies to the manager, stressing the importance of being ready in a world as expansive as this one. He is curious and asks the sword spirit why he called him a pushover, but the sword spirit insists that he never said such a thing. He agrees with the sword spirit's denial. It then jokes with Ganja, saying that he's doing just fine on his own and doesn't need to be babied. He disagrees with this, mentioning that he would prefer if the sword spirit talk less. The spirit sees Ganja happy and jokes about his happiness. He himself confirms this feeling, stating that this particular moment signifies just the beginning of his adventure. As he ponders on the many times he has died and been reborn, a staggering total of 4,000, he acknowledges the special chance he has been given with his ability to come back to life. Although he used to be solely focused on seeking revenge, he now sees the value in enjoying. The sword spirit mentions that he recalls Kim Zombie saying that fees are important for education. He now possesses the resources. It then inquires about his next step. Ganja responds that finding a skilled instructor. To this, the sword spirit asserts that the teacher is already present before him. Ganja inwardly criticizes the spirit for his lack of shame. Undeterred, it proceeds to stress the necessity of acquiring a textbook. He compares it to some ancient scroll containing the principles of martial arts or some sort of elixir that could enhance his physical abilities. However, given his current level, it decides that he wouldn't be able to comprehend even secret martial arts texts. He recommends that the only option for him is to purchase a high-end elixir instead. Ganja asks how good it has to be. The sword spirit mentions a guild called the House of the Alchemist, where skilled doctors and pharmacists work, and spirits who have found an elixir created by the finest craftsmen in that guild. He also mentions knowing a store where they might find what they need. Ganja expresses concern about the high cost of the elixir, and the spirit confirms that they are indeed very expensive. It whispers the approximate price in his ear, and a shocked expression appears on his face as he realizes that even with all his remaining assets, he can only afford a few elixirs. He becomes worried, and the sword spirit mocks the situation, mentioning the possibility of getting a bulk discount on five bottles, then tells the lad to follow him. Ganja reluctantly agrees to follow him, but requests to go slower. Suddenly, the spirit stops abruptly, prompting Ganja to question the sudden change of pace. With a serious expression, it instructs him to hide and admits forgetting to mention something important. As they peek around the corner, they notice Saint's sword approaching. The sword spirit informs Ganja that the store they're heading to is Saint's favorite. Disappointed, he expresses frustration that it only informed him now, realizing it should have been mentioned earlier. Glancing nervously toward the trash can he's hiding behind, Ganja anxiously covers his mouth, fearing being spotted. Fortunately, the sword saint turns and walks away. After his departure, Ganja expresses his disappointment at being compelled to hide behind a trash can. The sword spirit realizes the gravity of the situation, understanding that if the old man is there, he must have come to clear out the potions as well. Urgently, the sword spirit summons Ganja, and they begin running together. As they see the sword saint entering the store, the spirit complains that they are a step behind and wonders what they should do. As it's considered the best store in the area, Ganja deems it too dangerous to enter the same store as the sword saint. He then checks the rankings on his phone but fails to find what he's looking for in the top 20 rankings or even the top 100. Even after expanding the search range to the top 300, he still can't find anything. The sword spirit asks what he means, and Ganja smiles and explains that they might not have to spend as much as they expected. They can probably get those potions pretty cheap. He claims to know an excellent pharmacist who can offer them elixirs of the highest quality for a small amount of money. When they enter a poor neighborhood, the spirit asks him if he realizes they've entered the slums. They attract the attention of some people who turn out to be gangsters. The spirit expresses doubt that a talented pharmacist would live in such a place. However, Ganja insists that the pharmacist is not only talented, but also once in a generation brilliant. The spirit is shocked and puzzled as to why a genius would live in such an area. Ganja replies that the sword spirit might not believe it if he didn't want to. Meanwhile, he notices the people around him, detecting that they are being followed, probably intending to rob them. He figures they probably think he's crazy for talking to himself. He wonders what their reaction would be if they found out about the money he has in his pocket. The sword spirit asks him if he knows how to get there. At that moment, they hear a girl's voice pleading with someone not to touch the lab equipment. 
Witnessing this ganja confirms that they have arrived at the right place. The situation changes when the man demands payment for overdue fees and threatens to pawn the equipment for the experiment. The green-haired girl asks not to hand everything over to the pawn shop because she wouldn't be able to earn a living. But the money lender doesn't care as she will never make enough to pay it back anyway. He remains stubborn and orders his men to take everything. The girl desperately asks for just a week or even five days. The man taunts her, reminding her that the last time she asked for a week, it turned into a month and now that month has become half a year. She explains to him that many of the potions are not yet ready. The man pulling the cart expresses frustration, pushing the cart back and knocking the girl over. He advises her not to try a different carer. As the girl sits on the ground, people watch and some begin to discuss the situation. Some point to the collapse of her business, saying they had expected it. The high price of her healing potions is also mentioned. Others criticize her for not taking the business world seriously at her young age. In response, the green-haired girl feels that the quality of her medicines justifies their cost, asserting that they cannot be found elsewhere in Babylon of the same quality. She tells them they should be grateful for her doing business in their area and expresses regret for operating in such a horrible city. People make fun of her, calling her delusional and mocking her for thinking so highly of herself. As the crowd starts to disperse, the girl is trying to persuade them to buy a bottle of her unique healing potion. At the same time, the sword spirit gazes at Ganja with a skeptical look, questioning whether the individual in front of them is indeed the greatest pharmacist of all time as he had claimed. Ganja replies, what if she actually is, and starts to make his way over to the girl. The spirit tries to stop him, but he approaches the crying green-haired girl and asks if she is still in business. When he catches her gaze, he immediately identifies her as someone who is not a crazy alchemist or a failure. He expresses his interest in purchasing a costly item, to which she, the esteemed master alchemist, responds affirmatively, assuring him that she is capable of creating whatever he desires. He is in the presence of a skilled alchemist who will climb the ranks to become one of the top five in the guild and will lead the House of Alchemy Guild. The alchemist is taken aback by Ganja's request and asks for an explanation for the unusually large order. He nonchalantly responds with 20,000 gold coins. The alchemist is astonished, but he insists that she fulfill the order. He recognizes the opportunity to establish a connection with her even before she achieves a high rank. It's like finding a valuable golden goose for him. Noticing her hesitation in accepting the order, he questions her once again. He ultimately informs her that he'll remain a loyal customer until the very end. She opens the door to her lab and comments on how chaotic and untidy it is. At the same time, the sword spirit voices his disapproval stating that the place doesn't appear clean at all. He expresses concern to Ganja about consuming the elixir created by the alchemist in such a messy environment. The alchemist then clarifies if he had actually placed an order for it worth 20,000 gold. Ganja questions her, asking if she has any doubts about his trustworthiness. He suggests to pay her in advance, but she insists that it's not needed. However, if it's possible, she would prefer to receive the payment first. Ganja privately thinks that if she can't even show basic manners, she must be in a desperate financial situation. He advises her to withdraw the necessary amount of money from his account and assures her that he will inform the party beforehand. He tells her that he wants her to stick to a budget of around 20,000 gold because his funds are not unlimited. When the alchemist asks what kind of elixir he wants, she makes it clear that she will not include any illegal drugs in it. Refusing to create anything with illegal substances is something she stands firm on. He observes that even though her store has closed down, she still has the courage to turn down a large sum of money. He praises her beliefs, acknowledging that her uncomplicated yet powerful convictions will result in her becoming an exceptional genius. He assures her that he won't request any kind of drugs. Intrigued, she inquires about the specifics of the request. Annoyingly, the sword spirit comments that she doesn't appear to be very skilled, but he will provide him with the recipe. He mentions that he will only explain it politely, so he must pay close attention and repeat it to the alchemist. The sword spirit is sharing the formula with the alchemist, goes over each ingredient carefully. The list includes the liver of a rabbit, the eyes of a magic cat, the skin of a huge desert snake, and the tail of a green salamander. The sword spirit confirms that there are a total of 23 ingredients in the formula. Anja is assured by the spirit that these are all the necessary materials, and it's up to the pharmacist's skill to bring it all together. The girl double-checks and confirms that he has understood everything correctly. 
The sword spirit is taken aback when she mentions that the mixed ingredients significantly enhance reflexes and create a top-notch formula. She clarifies that instead of refining the ingredients individually, they are immediately combined and stewed together. The spirit is astonished by this revelation and is about to inquire how she came to know this. However, Ganja interrupts and affirms the alchemist's explanation. She smiles and carries on with her explanation. She mentions that the ingredients typically have a small dose of poison, but there's a way to counteract it by using the liver that was consumed. However, the purification process can lead to various side effects, ranging from completely opposite effects like day and night. Ganja is amazed by the presence of these knowledgeable experts back then. She further elaborates on the explanation, stating that one of the effects is to boost the basic metabolism. Ganja cuts off her explanation and inquires about the duration needed to create the elixir. She responds that it would take four days, given that there is sufficient funding. She clarifies that under regular circumstances, it could be completed more quickly, but it would necessitate acquiring new equipment. Ganja recalls the period when individuals would wait outside the alchemist's residence for a whole year just to have her concoct potions. He grins and remarks that completing it in four days is an absolute bargain. As they exit the alchemist's shop, the spirit feels unsatisfied with her and questions her skills. He believes that those who talk excessively are usually deceitful, and he feels that Ganja has wasted his money. Curious, he inquires about the sword spirit's knowledge of the formula, and the spirit proudly reveals that he personally developed it by experimenting with different poisons. Ganja recalls the alchemist's high praise for the formula. He urges the sword spirit to acknowledge its credibility. Additionally, he confidently predicts that despite her current appearance, she will become the most influential figure in the alchemical realm within a decade. However, the spirit avoids eye contact and maintains a skeptical attitude, suspecting that she might deceive them and run with their money. Currently, they are seated in a hotel room, four days after their initial meeting. The alchemist has just arrived with three boxes, which she explains took longer than anticipated to assemble due to the combination of various materials. She apologizes for the delay, but Ganja reassures her, stating that it is not a problem. He reminds her that he had initially mentioned a four-day time frame. The alchemist proceeds to hand him the boxes, clarifying that each box holds 30 bottles, providing enough supply for a minimum of 30 days. Ganja is now realizing the true worth of his investment, realizing that the store is actually 15 times more effective than what the sword spirit had originally believed. The spirit picks up on Ganja's thoughts and questions whether he is berating himself for his previous assumptions. The alchemist, feeling slightly uncomfortable, inquires why he had made such a costly demand for a pharmacist without a known name like herself. Even though she possesses the ability to comprehend and create formulas that only a select few in Babylon can accurately do, she is still regarded as eccentric by others. He is convinced that it's due to her being a genius of her era that the pharmacist before her entrusted her with an expensive task. However, there is another underlying explanation. He recalls how she was the first to hurriedly go to the capital when it was engulfed in flames, determined to uncover the true identity of the flame emperor and not be deceived by him. She possessed remarkable abilities, including skill, kindness, and a deep understanding of others. It would be a tremendous missed opportunity not to form a close bond with someone as exceptional as her. Ganja mentions that he assisted her due to her genuine kindness, but he believes that she would have achieved success even without his help. He extends his hand and genuinely shares his viewpoint. He strongly believes that skilled hunters like them should thrive in order to provide mutual support in the future. He finds it disheartening that only deranged psychopaths seem to achieve success. He sincerely wishes them both the very best. He truly means every word he utters and doesn't believe he can be any more truthful than this. She concurs with him and firmly shakes his hand. She says that in order to make a difference in the world, he needs to achieve success first. As she departs, she informs Ganja that if he has any inquiries, he can reach out to her anytime. He smiles and expresses gratitude towards her. The sword spirit moves nearer to his ear and queries his remarks about skilled hunters like them. He realizes that he might have made an awkward statement and proposes that he begin practicing instead. As he steps into the hunting grounds on the third floor, he is met with a horde of orcs and goblins. The sheer number of them overwhelms him, making it quite a challenge to handle. Once he manages to defeat the monsters, he finds himself pondering his next move. The spirit offers some guidance, suggesting that he should consume the elixir before anything else. Ganja decides to follow the advice, and to his surprise, the elixir tastes rather ordinary, 
with a subtle scent of lemon and honey. But then, out of nowhere, a sharp pain shot through his body, alerting him to the fact that something was amiss. The sword spirit's face lit up with a mischievous smile as he commended the pharmacist's expertise, explaining that the elixir had indeed done its job. Ganja, however, is left bewildered by the sword spirit's words and is plagued by an excruciating headache. Nevertheless, the sword spirit clarified that the elixir had temporarily numbed his senses, allowing him to perceive even the tiniest details, such as counting each strand of hair on his head, granting him extra time to react. He can feel the sweat trickling down his face, a direct result of the potion's effects. It heightens his perception of reality, making him more aware of his surroundings. He questions Gong Jia about his inability to sense it, leaving him puzzled. When asked to clarify, the sword spirit mentions that Gonja's aura is shifting within his heart. This phenomenon occurs within every hunter who enters the tower, yet most go about their daily lives without ever noticing it. The spirit stresses the importance of mastering his aura control to enhance his chances in battle. Gonja shields his ears and struggles to manage the intense sensations washing over him. With a grin, the spirit mentions that one can typically sense the aura's energy through meditation, but it's a time-consuming process. He bluntly states that Gonja's physical state will suffer due to his lack of innate ability. As the orcs launch a surprise attack from behind, the spirit advises him to flee to avoid getting hurt.